So uh, thanks so much for having me, Brian, and thanks to the Humanity Center for hosting. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about beauty, which is uh, one of the things that I publish about, um, on. I am a bona fide philosopher of art, so I have to have something to say about beauty. Um, and uh, I thought I'd tell you about um, a philosopher that has had a huge influence on thinking about aesthetic value. Um, uh, even up to this day, uh, there's current debates about not only how to interpret um, David Hume's thinking about um, the aesthetic, but uh, also various other debates that have been inspired by, uh, by his work. So what I thought I'd do is uh, tell you a little bit uh, about David Hume, um, but also tell you about this essay of the standard of taste, which um, um, details uh, some of his views about um, the objectivity of aesthetic value. So uh, just a little bit about Hume. About Hume. He was a Scottish philosopher. Um, that's more or less what he looked like, died in 1776. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, but he was, he was an essayist, a historian, an economist. He contributed to lots of fields um, and is often considered to be one of the best philosophers uh, writing in English and by many philosophers working today to be one of the best philosophers, period. Um, so many people would rank him number one, you know, above Plato and Aristotle. Um, so, uh, and, you know, notable fact, his first book was published when he was 28. So I don't know what you were doing in your 20s, but um, it's pretty impressive if you ask me. Um, and Of the Standard of Taste was published in 1757 um, in a collection of um, essays called, uh, called Four Dissertations. And another claim to fame that Hume has um, is that he awoke Immanuel Kant from his dogmatic slumber. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about Kant. Um, Michelle will talk about Kant later. And he's, uh, along with Locke and Berkeley, considered one of the founders um, and most able proponents of British empiricism. So, um, Of the Standard of Taste is a famous essay in large part for its defense of the idea that aesthetic judgments are not mere expressions of preference. So when you say that's beautiful, you're not just saying, I like that, or, ooh, it pleases me. You're saying something more objective. And Hume's idea is that there are standards of objectivity that we can uh, articulate to prove that um, there is, in fact, disputing about taste. It isn't actually all in the eye of the beholder, as many people will say. So what I want to do is explain Hume's essay and his argument to you, uh, and then uh, briefly, if I have time, just discuss a contemporary debate that um, is inspired by Hume's view, just so you have a sense that this stuff is still alive and well. So um, <clears throat> one thing that's confusing about of the standard of taste, which is very Googleable if you uh, want to follow along, <laughs> um, is that he doesn't really Hume doesn't really tell you what he's up to until the sixth paragraph. The, the essay has numbered paragraphs in most editions. Um, and what he says there is that it's natural for us to, to seek a standard of taste by which the various sentiments of men may be reconciled, or at least a decision afforded confirming one sentiment and condemning another. Why is it natural for us to seek this? Well, um, as he notes at the beginning, and as you'd all agree, I'm sure, there's a great variety of taste. We have different, as we make a different aesthetic judgments about paintings, about novels, we listen to different bands, we like different poets, and so on and so forth. And this difference in taste is even greater than it might appear at first, um, because although we might agree about the meanings of various aesthetic terms, um, like is delicate or elegant or spirited, uh, when it comes to particulars, which works are elegant, which works are spirited, that's when we disagree even if we do agree about the meanings of our relevant terms. So what Hume is hoping for is to discover a standard of taste by which our various disagreements can be reconciled. If you think one poet is better than another, and I think the opposite, who's right? Who's wrong? Is it possible to even state a standard here? So what he acknowledges, though, right away, is that there's a sort of uh, a variety of criticism or a philosophy out there that um, would make this search for a standard of taste impossible. Um, so he says, there's a variety of philosophy that cuts off all hope of success in such an attempt and represents the impossibility of ever attaining any standard of taste. 
Uh, he wants to show that this, what we call subjectivism in philosophy about aesthetic matters, is untenable. And that clears the way for him to seek a standard of taste. So um, subjectivism is the view I hinted at before, just the view that um, when someone says, that's beautiful, all they're doing is expressing their preference or expressing a feeling that they have about the object. They're not making any claims about it such that we could disagree. So if I say cucumbers are tasty and you say, no, they're not, uh, we don't disagree, right? I just think they taste good and you don't. There's no sub substantial matter over which we can uh, have a dispute or have an argument. You can't convince me by some uh, profound argument that I'm, that I'm wrong, right? They actually do taste good. No, I put them in my mouth and they're gross. That's it. That's the end of it. There's no disputing about the taste of cucumbers. But Hume wants to argue that there is disputing about aesthetic taste. Um, so he wants to disagree with these common statements, de gustibus non est disputandum, or non disputandum est. I guess in Latin you can go both ways. Um, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. There's no disputing about taste, and so on and so forth. He wants to argue that these common views are wrong. And so um, Hume has a nice argument against subjectivism that he gives right away. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but I'll read a part of it for you. But though this axiom by passing into a proverb seems to have attained the sanction of common sense, the axiom being there's no disputing about taste, there certainly is a species of common sense which opposes it, at least serves to modify and restrain it. Whoever would assert an equality of genius and elegance between Ogilby and Milton or Bunyan and Addison would be thought to defend no less an extravagance than if he had maintained a molehill to be as high as Tenerife or a pond as extensive as the ocean. So what he's saying there is that there are obvious truths about comparative aesthetic merit. So consider this truth, uh, or this statement. Britney Spears is as good a pop singer as Michael Jackson. Do you agree with that? Is someone who says that right or wrong? Him would say, obviously, they're wrong. OK? <coughs> FYI, it seems. <laughs> <Just>. <laughs> Lil Wayne is as good a rapper as Kendrick Lamar. False. Stephanie Meyer is a better writer than Marcel Proust. <laughs> Absurd, right? <laughs> Him says that laugh was great because he says that Though there may be found persons who give the preference to the former authors, no one pays attention to such a taste, and we pronounce without scruple the sentiment of these pretended critics to be absurd and ridiculous. So um, there must be something that our aesthetic judgment answers to. There are objective facts about who's better than whom, or uh, what works are good and which works are bad. So Hume wants to know how we can account for this. How can we account for the fact the apparent fact that there are standards of objectivity when it comes to aesthetic value. Here's his answer. Though the principles of taste be universal and nearly, if not, the same in all men, yet few are qualified to give judgment on any work of art or establish their own sentiment as the standard of beauty. Hence, a true judge in the finer arts is observed, even during the most polished ages, to be so rare a character. Strong sense, united to delicate sentiment, improved by practice, perfected by comparison, and cleared of all prejudice can alone entitle critics to this valuable character. And the joint verdict of such, wherever they're to be found, is the true standard of taste. So what the hell is he talking about? Well, the standard of taste, he thinks, is given by the joint verdict of a certain type of person. This person has a range of aesthetic virtues, essentially. The virtues are strong sense, delicate sentiment, improved by practice, perfected by comparison, and cleared of all prejudice. So um, a lot of these make sense when you think about how we judge works of art and, and matters of beauty. Um, strong sense, you have to be attentive to the kinds of feelings that a work um, can elicit. Um, uh, improved by practice. Uh, you can't have just seen one uh, you know, science fiction film uh, or seen a science fiction film uh, only one time and be able to judge sort of the quality of a science fiction film. You have to have seen multiple. And not only, or you, have to see, you usually have to have seen the thing multiple times. 
And not only that, you have to have compared it to other instances of science fiction. Otherwise, you might think that Plan 9 from Outer Space is the best science fiction film, because it's, you know, you've only seen two, and the other one is even worse. Um, <laughs> so, um, and Cleared of All Prejudice, um, which is, is quite obvious. Um, so, how does Hume argue for the view that this is indeed the standard of taste? Well, um, first he rules out the idea that there are fixed rules of composition. He says, to check the sallies of the imagination and to reduce every expression to geometrical truth and exactness would be the most contrary to the laws of criticism, because it would produce a work which, by universal experience, has been found the most insipid and disagreeable. His thought is, look, there's, there would obviously be a standard of taste <coughs> if there were really clear rules of composition, that is, rules that you had to follow in order to make a work. So if there were like a paint-by-numbers rules to make a painting, you could judge whether a painting is good just by looking at the paint-by-rules, uh, paint-by-numbers rules. Of course, there aren't such rules, because if there were, and everyone followed them, the products that uh, would come from that would be uh, insipid, boring, ugly, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, the aesthetic word people tend to use is formulaic or trite, right? Um, that's not to say that there aren't um, rules of some sort or other that operate in artworks. So, for example, there are rules for making a science fiction film. You can't just do whatever you want, right? You have to satisfy certain criteria for what you've produced to count as a science fiction film. But um, the genre rules are, uh, as it were, rough guidelines that can be um, played around with in various ways and don't fully determine the output in a way that would lead to this result. So second, he claims that if the standard isn't fixed a priori in a bunch of rules, then it must be fixed by experience in what he calls the common sentiments of human nature. He claims that this is the most evident from the durable admiration which attends those works that have survived all the caprices of mode and fashion, all the mistakes of ignorance and envy. His thought here is that um, there's something to be learned from the fact that there are masterpieces, works that stand the test of time um, and are admired across different cultures, across different people within a culture, and across time. So they're admired um, throughout history. And he gives an example of such a work, um, Homer. And then he concludes um, in the 12th paragraph, quote, there are certain general Proposi uh, sorry, principles of approbation and blame whose influence a careful eye may trace in all operations of the mind. Some particular forms or qualities from the original structure of the internal fabric are calculated to please and others to displease. He concludes this from the fact that there are masterpieces and he thinks that the only way you can explain how these masterpieces stand the test of time is to appeal to uh, this great phrase, uh, the original structure of the internal fabric. There's something in us that we all have in our human nature, such that these works appeal to that. Um, Hume's ideal critics are able, they, they are such that they have the aesthetic virtues that give them access to what makes these works appreciable, what makes them stand the test of time. And um, the joint verdict of people like that is what constitutes the standard of taste. So um, I'll give a summary in a moment, but um, you might have a couple of questions that, that Hume addresses in, in uh, the later parts of the essay. How do we know whether someone is a true critic? How do you pick them out? Hume calls this question embarrassing because um, it, seems to it seems to suggest, or one answer that you might give, is that it's a matter of taste whether someone's an ideal critic. That would be problematic because then uh, there would be no objective ideal critics. It would all just be you know, turtles of taste all the way down. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> in fact, Hume thinks it's not a, a matter of taste. He thinks it's a matter of fact whether there are ideal critics or whether someone is an ideal critic. One reason he gives is um, everyone will claim that some people have better taste than others. Uh, that seems true of social life, of people we know. We know people who have bad taste. We know people who have good taste. You might even think 
we ourselves have good taste. Um, so if some people can be better than others, why not think that some people can be the best? And then in, uh, shortly thereafter, he claims that um, in practice, we know who the better critics are. We can pick them out in a group of people, for example. Though men of delicate taste be rare, they're easily to be distinguished in society by the soundness of understanding and the superiority of their faculties above the rest of mankind. And his thought here is just, like, if you went to a museum with a bunch of people, you could just, you could just tell who the more practiced critics are, who the less prejudiced critics are, that is, the ones who have more delicacy of taste. You can tell which ones have more of these aesthetic virtues than others. <clears throat> and uh, in section 28, he admits that there are legitimate sources of variation among the ideal critics. Um, that is, critics, although they're ideal, will sometimes disagree in certain ways. Um, and one source of the variation is the humors of particular men, and the others is the particular manners and opinions of our age and country. So um, finally, they might agree on how valuable they are, but differ in their personal preferences. As Hume says uh, in this wonderful phrase, um, we choose our favorite author as we do our friend. So sometimes our judgments of taste about aesthetic matters reflect um, not just our um, humors, as it were, our personality, or the manners of our um, particular age and country, that is our culture, but also um, our, what you might think of our, as our individuality, our individual values. So does that mean that, according to Hume, all ideal critics have more or less the same aesthetic sensibility? Yes and no. So Hume admits that there are legitimate sources of variation among the ideal critics. These variations often serve to produce a difference in the degrees of our approbation and blame, um, but not necessarily in what we approve or disapprove of. So um, we might both agree that Homer's great, but you know, you're really enthusiastic about Homer, and I'm like, it's good. You know, it's solid. It's a masterpiece. Um, so we can we can agree about you know, the cases, but disagree about sort of the the, the strength of our approbation or blame. And um, as I just mentioned, another source of variation is the humors of particular men and the manners and opinions of our age and country. And um, as Hume says, where there is such a diversity in the internal frame or the external situation as is entirely blameless on both sides and leaves no room to give one the preference above the other, in that case, a certain degree of diversity in judgment is unavoidable, and we seek in vain for a standard by which we can reconcile contrary sentiments. So what he's allowing for here is the possibility of what philosophers call blameless disagreement. So in other words, he doesn't think that the uh, standard of taste is going to decide clearly in favor of one work or the other in every case. It's possible that some works are such that um, we can disagree about their merit and be such that um, neither of us is making a mistake of taste um, in our disagreement. That seems right, I think, about the aesthetic. Um, it doesn't seem right to say that um, if there is a standard of taste, it will have a clear output for every sort of comparison that you, that you plug in. Um, you know, uh, we might both agree that, um, well, suppose I think Leonard Cohen is better than Bob Dylan, and you think Bob Dylan is better than Leonard Cohen. It seems like conceivable there that um, there's no fault um, at issue. There's a blameless disagreement. We can disagree and be such that neither of us is making a mistake. Compare that to your claim that Britney Spears is better than Michael Jackson and my claim that Michael Jackson is better than Britney Spears. There is, that's a, a faultful disagreement, right? We disagree and someone's wrong. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not me. <laughs> um, so finally, uh, as, as Hume says, they might agree in their approbation and degree of approbation, but differ in their personal preferences. Um, as he says, we choose our favorite author as we do our friend um, from a conformity of humor and disposition. Good. So just briefly reconstructing Hume's view, um, it goes like this. Masterpieces are the artworks that have stood the test of time, i.e. they've been appreciated across people, cultures, and times. And these are works about which there's no doubt concerning their aesthetic value. 
it's certain that they're worthy. Um, fully appreciating masterpieces requires a range of aesthetic virtues, strong sense, united to, to delicate sentiment, and so on. And of course, the masterpieces are going to vary across genre. It'll be masterworks in painting, and sculpture, and film, and so on and so forth. So someone who's able to fully appreciate all these masterworks is going to have a range of virtues that are cultivated and deep across genres, across media, and so on. A true judge, or as people call them today, ideal critics, is anyone who has these virtues. They can be trusted to judge well in matters of aesthetic value. Of course, even those who, who have such aesthetic virtues will differ here and there in personality, culture, and individual values. And for that reason, the standard of taste is not determined by any single ideal critic, but by the joint verdict of them, um, those who have those virtues. So you might think here of you know, Metacritic or Rotten Tomatoes, right? It's not any one critic. It's, you get a percentage based on kind of the, the, whole, uh, the whole flood of critics. Um, so the bad ones will be weeded out. The good ones will kind of coalesce around, around the truth and so on. And that's, that's how Hume is thinking here. Um, good. So uh, if I have like two minutes, I'll just run through this. Uh, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about a contemporary debate, one that I'm involved in. Um, but it's uh, pretty interesting, I think. So, um, so uh, Hume seems to say that there are three things that play an important role in our aesthetic judgments, personality, culture, and individual <coughs> values. That's in addition to um, the various aesthetic virtues he thinks we can have, um, delicacy of taste, strong judgment, and so on, comparison, lack of bias. Um, but now, Suppose that my personality, culture, and individual values are such that I can't listen to Mozart. I just can't do it. I listen to it, and I'm like, yeah, some people like this, I understand, but like, ugh, right? It just, every time, it just doesn't sink in. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. Um, and I don't even really get why some people really love it, right? I get maybe like it's technically good or something, but I don't get why people love it. Now, suppose an ideal critic comes along and says, hey, Nick, look. You really should learn to love Mozart. You're, you're missing out on the beauty that's there, or the aesthetic value. We all agree that it's superior to the things that you like, Leonard Cohen, Schubert, Radiohead, Modest Mouse, uh, etc. Now, should I take the ideal critic's advice? Another way to think about this question is um, whether I should try to be like an ideal critic in my own aesthetic life. Yeah, We're all in the business of appreciating beauty, um, especially here at the University of San Diego. So how should we go about it? One answer is that you should just try to be like the ideal critic. I mean, think about it. They have access to all the beauty in the world. That's what their ideal sensibility gives them, right? If there's beauty there, they see it, they appreciate it, they feel it, they, uh, and they can tell you all about it and so on. But my personality, culture, and individual values inform my current tastes or my sensibility. So to appreciate Mozart, it seems that I'd have to change something that's part of my sensibility, my personality, maybe my culture, or even my individual values. But if I do that, <coughs> then I'm going to lose my love for some of the things I currently deeply value. Learning to love Mozart, for example, might diminish my love for Schubert, or diminish my love for uh, Radiohead or something. So there seems to be a tension between cultivating my own sensibility as it, as it is, given my culture, personality, and values, and trying to become like an ideal critic to have greater access to the world of beauty. So it seems that I should and I should not uh, take the critic's advice. It seems like there's some value in taking it, but some disvalue too. So um, I don't have an answer to this question, but what Hume has inspired here is uh, an answer to the question of how we should live our aesthetic lives. How should you pursue aesthetic value, given that you want to um, deepen your access to beauty, experience the beauty of the world? Should you become like an ideal critic? Some philosophers have proposed that answer, that you should develop the sensibility of an ideal critic, inspired by Hume. But I think that this, uh, this runs into problems, because on the one hand, we think when we pursue aesthetic value in our lives, we do want to broaden our access to beauty, right? 
we want to see more of the beauty that's out there, learn to appreciate things that we don't yet appreciate, um, learn about new types of painting, new types of sculpture, see new films from around the world, and so on. So we want to expand our access to the world's beauty, but we also want to maintain and cultivate the meaningful aesthetic attachments that we have to the works that we love, the profound works in our lives, the, poem, the poets we love, the bands we, uh, we study and play for our friends and listen to time and time again, the paintings that we want to revisit every time we go to the Met. But these two things conflict. Right? These two desires that I'm suggesting are sort of essential to your pursuit of aesthetic value conflict. On the one hand, um, insofar as we're expanding our sensibility, learning to appreciate new beauty, we're not maintaining and cultivating the meaningful aesthetic attachments that we have. And vice versa, insofar as we are maintaining and cultivating our meaningful aesthetic attachments, we're not pursuing the wider world of aesthetic value. So Hume's ideal critic speaks to the first feature of aesthetic life, that tells us how we can expand our access to beauty. But it doesn't speak to the second. It doesn't, um, it doesn't fully account for the fact that that's not the only thing we want to do in aesthetic life. We also want to deepen our uh, connections to the beauty that we already love. Um, so whatever the aesthetic ideal is, it's got to reconcile one and two. Um, Hume's of the standard of taste doesn't give us the answer to that. But it may well give us a really cool answer to uh, the question of how do we reconcile disputes about aesthetic matters? We appeal to the ideal critics. All right, thank you. So, uh, a central task in this series on the idea of beauty has been to work out what the word beauty means, what it refers to, what kinds of things can properly be called beautiful, and so on. And in this task, uh, the ideas of Edmund Burke, as these are put forward in his book, A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful, are very important. Like, the, like Hume's essay, um, it's actually 1757 this was published, so we have a nice overlap. Um, Burke's ideas here are um, useful and provocative. Uh, I want to spell out the distinguishing features of the sublime and the beautiful as Burke articulates these, say a little about uh, Burke's account of why beautiful things give us pleasure, and then finally say a word or two about how the distinction between the sublime and the beautiful finds an echo in Burke's conservative reaction to radical and revolutionary politics. Burke's mostly now, of course, as, a, as you know, the, um, the prophet of modern conservatism. So we'll start with the distinction between the sublime and the beautiful. It's a sign of the way, I suppose, that language alters and mutates over time, that the way people often use the word sublime today differs markedly from what Burke and his audience meant. Um, it often seems now that the word sublime is just being used as a synonym for beauty or for at least for an extraordinary and breathtaking example of something beautiful. Uh, two examples of this modern usage. Uh, Whitney Houston's voice, one music journalist writes, was, and I quote, a, a sublime mix of gospel purity, pop prissiness, whatever that is, and bedroom purr. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that again because I very rarely get the chance to use the words bedroom purr. <laughs> Secondly, um, I recently saw a headline in the sports pages that the Real Madrid footballer Cristiano Ronaldo, who I hate, uh, had, quote, scored a sublime goal in training. Now, these are uses of the word sublime that uh, Burke would not recognize. At most, they contain one element of the sublime, that of the astonishing. Uh, other than that, we're far removed from the Burkean sublime in both of these examples. And let's see how this goes. Burke's intention is in part to disambiguate the notions of the sublime and the beautiful and to show how they are clearly to be distinguished from each other. Burke's schema is grounded in the antithesis of pain and pleasure, pain being the foundation of the sublime, pleasure being the foundation of the beautiful. Now, linking the sublime in this manner with pain brings to prominence the idea that we can experience a certain kind of delight when confronted with things that are terrifying. This is a, 
a famous passage from Burke. Whatever is fitted in any way to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any way, in any sort, terrible, or is uh, conversant about terrible objects, or operates in a manner analogous to terror, is a source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. When danger or pain press too nearly, they are incapable of giving any delight and are simply terrible. But at certain distances and with certain modifications, they may be and they are delightful, as we every day experience. This idea, with its emphasis on distances, um, should not really be peculiar to any of us. To take a banal example, uh, I regularly pay $20 or so to see and enjoy movies featuring aliens, ghosts, serial killers, and so on. Now, in real life, I would run away and at speed <laughs> from actually experiencing anything like that. Now, Burke has a theory about why this should be so, and we can perhaps touch on that later, if time permits. What's more important for our purposes right now is how Burke isolates features of sublime objects. Now, these uh, features are easily listed, and they're up here those of you who like schematic representations, yeah. as well as astonishment and terror, we have, first of all, obscurity. Now, clear views of things allow us to become accustomed to them, but obscurity adds to a thing's terror. This is why Burke says nighttime adds to our dread, why ghosts and goblins, things we can't form clear images of, are so terrifying. This also comes to mind whenever I think about the alien movies particularly the first Alien movie, which is terrifying because you don't really get, you don't get to see the thing. So your, your mind's filling in the gaps. With the subsequent movies in that franchise, the horror's gone and they become thrillers or action movies because you can see the thing. It's when you can't see it, the obscurity of it terrifies you. Uh, secondly, well, next on this, power, especially power linked to the capacity for destruction. The idea of God, for example, is for Burke a, power, a sublime idea. Powerful animals that have not been rendered serviceable to human beings are also evocative of the sublime. A tame animal, however big and powerful it is, Burke says can never be sublime. A tame animal is always, in his words, contemptible. So an ox, an ox is not sublime, but a bull could be sublime. Privation is darkness, solitude, and silence. Vastness, Burke describes this in terms of great heights looking up at a sheer rock face, great depths, staring down into a bottomless chasm. And connected with vastness, we have infinity. Uh, vastness and infinity come together when we think about uh, the supremely uh, sublime experience of contemplating the starry sky. There's this great line in um, uh, Pascal, which we all know, uh, the eternal silence of those infinite spaces terrifies me. The terror of looking up at the night sky is a, is a sublime experience. Sounds of a certain type are evocative of the sublime, Burke thinks. A, a loudness that overpowers sudden and unexpected noises. Sounds that are low, tremulous, confused, and intermitting. One of the wonderful things about Burke's book is it, it gives you a kind of taxonomy of the horror genre. When you watch a horror movie, you see these certain things, use certain sounds, uh, 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 awful. And uh, you can read Burke and you understand what's going on, and you can go direct your own movie. Um, so you've got specific examples of the sublime. He lists as the ocean, starry heavens, cliffs, chasms, ghosts, raging storms, thunder, uh, the cries of unseen and threatening animals in a forest, the striking of a great clock in the darkness of the night, and so on. Now, certain of these contributory ideas can be illustrated in the work of the German painter Caspar David Friedrich. Um, in Burke's discussion of the sublime, um, as we've seen, Burke claims that terror is best aroused by things dark, uncertain, and confused. And the idea of a foggy landscape might here present itself to us, such as this one by Friedrich. Friedrich himself wrote, and I quote, when a landscape is covered in fog, it appears larger, more sublime, and heightens the strength of the imagination and excites expectation rather like a veiled woman. And here's an example of, of that from, from 
Friedrich. Friedrich's also unparalleled, really, in showing the vast and destructive powers of nature and of humanity's impotence in the face of this. Here's the classic example of Friedrich's great painting, The Sea of Ice. You know, note the enormous angularity of these pieces of ice and the tiny ship is crushed, or human aspirations and, and hopes crushed in that. Uh, on to the beautiful. So that's the sublime. The beautiful is a very different thing. Burke concisely defines it in these terms. So if we say, well, what, is, what do we mean by beauty? Burke's going to give us a definition. By beauty, I mean, and this is Burke saying this, by beauty, I mean that quality or those qualities in bodies by which they cause love or some passion similar to it. Now, we saw that when we went in the ancient philosophy. Now, Burke dismisses prevailing ideas of beauty concerning proportion and utility, and instead, as he had done with regard to the sublime, assembles a series of sensible qualities that by experience we find beautiful. Uh, beautiful objects are accordingly characterized by smallness, first of all. Um, Burke has characterized the sublime in terms of vastness, the beautiful, on the other hand, has the contrasting quality of smallness. Burke thinks this marches with common usage. We typically will say, he thinks, that's a big, ugly thing, but not, that's a big, beautiful thing. Um, Donald Trump tends to, this is quite topical today, uh, <laughs> Donald Trump tends to speak of his big, beautiful border wall, but that seems <coughs> idiosyncratic. That, that linking of the big and the beautiful. Indeed, noting the connection of beauty to love, Burke notes our use of diminutive terms. He says, we add the endearing name of little to everything we love. My little vole or something. For <laughs> Secondly, smoothness. This is very important for Burke. Uh, Burke speaks of smoothness as a quality so essential to beauty that I do not recollect anything beautiful that is not smooth. He says, in trees and flowers, smooth leaves are beautiful, smooth slopes of earth in gardens, smooth streams in the landscape, smooth coats of birds and beasts in animal beauties, in fine women, smooth skins, and in several sorts of ornamental furniture, smooth and polished surfaces. This is uh, connected with the third feature, is probably the most important thing in, in Burke's account of beauty, the, the idea of gradual variation. Uh, Burke contends that ruggedness, sudden projections, sharp angles are all antithetical to beauty. Angularity and beauty do not coexist. Burke claims instead that beautiful objects and bodies consist of lines that vary gradually. Now, in this, he appears to follow William Hogarth, the painter who, in his book, The Analysis of Beauty, published four years earlier, had isolated what Hogarth called the line of beauty, an S-shaped line or serpentine line that was indicative of gracefulness. Now, Burke's famous description um, of uh, these gradually varying lines um, reveals how much he had in mind a particular conception of female beauty. The, the new OUP edition of of the book, by the way, is really written with this, uh, it's really constructed with this passage in mind. He says, this is Burke, it is most, Burke's a very erotic writer, people don't notice this, but he's, this is, he's deeply er eroticized, even in the trial of Warren Hastings, he's just <laughs> obsessed with, with erotic imagery. Observe that part of a beautiful woman where she is perhaps the most beautiful about the neck and breasts, the smoothness, the softness, the easy and insensible swell the variety of the surface, which is never for the smallest space the same, the deceitful maze, lovely phrase, through which the unsteady eye slides giddily without knowing where to fix or whither it is carried. If you go back to this list, delicacy again is a feature of the, of the beautiful. Strength and power, Burke thinks, are prejudicial to beauty. An appearance of delicacy, he says, even of fragility, is almost essential to beauty. Flowers, 
precisely due to their delicacy, are more beautiful than robust trees. And of course, Burke ties, again, a notorious passage, Burke ties this very firmly to the feminine. He says, the beauty of women, I'm quoting, the beauty of women is considerably owing, I'm waiting for things to be thrown at me, considerably owing to their weakness or delicacy and is even enhanced by their timidity, a quality of mind analogous to it. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, who was disgusted by Burke's book, I think, or disgusted by, <laughs> disgusted by Burke in general, in fact, saw this equation of women and delicacy as a, an act of political oppression on Burke's part. Those women who have read the inquiry, she wrote to Burke, and convinced by your arguments, may have laboured to be pretty by counterfeiting weakness. This clearly opens up the possibility of a feminist critique of the idea of beauty, spearheaded by Wollstonecraft, I should add. And we'll consider that later on in this series. At the very least, we may want to note, as many people have noted, that Burke seems to be at times conflating beauty with prettiness. It's, it's not entirely obvious he's talking about beauty, or he's got a very sort of tame, sort of prissy conception of, of beauty. Anyway, with these ideas spelled out, it's easy to see the dramatic contrast between the sublime and the beautiful, ideas of a very different nature. Now, I just want to say a quick word about the next two themes. Um, first of all, Burke's explanation of why beautiful things give pleasure. This is a physiological explanation. I'll leave on one side the explanation he provides for the feeling of the sublime, since beauty is our prime concern. The qualities of beautiful things, smoothness, gradual variation, etc., produce what Burke calls a relaxation of the fibres. Beauty acts, he says, by, I quote, relaxing the solids of the whole system. And this is very different from the effects of the sublime, which, rooted in terror and pain, produce what Burke calls an unnatural tension of the nerves. Darkness hurts the eyes. It strains the nerves and the fibres of the iris. The same goes for obscure things of immense size. The eye struggles to take it in. It feels uncomfortable. How different things are when we're in the presence of the beautiful. Here he says, this is, this is what happens to you when you're looking at beautiful things. The head reclines something on one side. The eyelids are more closed than usual, and the eyes roll gently with the inclination on the object. The mouth is a little opened, and the breath drawn slowly with now and then a low sigh. The whole body is composed and the hands fall idly to the side. All this is accompanied by an inward sense of melting and languor. Now, uh, Freudian ears are likely to prick up upon uh, hearing those words. They seem very evocative of uh, Freud's descriptions um, of the post-orgasmic state and its similarity to the infant's blissful condition after being fed at the breast. Uh, when Burke then links the smoothness and sweetness of the beautiful to milk, which he calls the first support of our childhood, this connection seems complete. Beauty has the capacity to resurrect those feelings of love, warmth, and safety that we experienced as infants. Indeed, towards the end of the book, uh, Burke talks about a gentle rocking motion of the kind used to put children to sleep as being more beautiful than either sudden movements or motionless rest. He's taking us back, I think, to our experiences of childhood. One last observation on this. Burke is principally known as a political thinker, of course, the architect of modern conservatism, and his thoughts about social and political life and his critique of radical politics are not, I think, entirely divorced from what he writes about the beautiful. This crucial distinction between the beautiful and the sublime finds in the political realm a corresponding distinction between reform and innovation. Political reform, for Burke, is gradual, smooth, and continuous, corresponding to how he conceives of the beautiful. The line of beauty, Burke writes, varies by a very insensible deviation. It never varies so quickly as to surprise or by the sharpness of its angle to cause any twitching or convulsion in the optic nerve. Now, Burke never tires of contrasting reform with revolutionary activity. Revolutionary activity, by its nature, being convulsive and disruptive, in a word, innovative. And we have to remember that for Burke, the innovative is always a bad thing. Burke 
describes himself in a, in a letter as, you know, he says, I have always been a hater of violence and innovation. Linking those things together, violence and innovation are linked together because they're disruptive. He says, to innovate is not to reform. These things are different. This is why, in part, Burke abhorred the French Revolution, he says, famously. The French revolutionists complained of everything. They refused to reform anything, and they left nothing, no nothing at all, unchanged. Now, it's moreover of interest to note that Burke tended to describe the French Revolution in terms of the sublime. The proper response to the French Revolution, he always said, was astonishment. He says, the French Revolution was, and I quote, the most astonishing thing that has hitherto happened in the world. Moreover, he said, or moreover, he depicts the revolutionary forces of Jacobinism in terms of obscurity and horror. Jacobinism, he says, is a shapeless monster born of hell and chaos, a vast, tremendous, unformed specter an overpowering, hideous phantom that he says has emerged out of the grave of the, the French monarchy. Now, this horrifying and frenetic French activity can be contrasted with the tranquility of English life, as this is frequently depicted by Burke, the English tied by smooth bonds of affection to what he calls our little platoons, going about our business, unmolested by radicals, deranged intellectuals, and the meddling implementers of theory. So English life, the smoothness of English life, is contrasted with the angular horrors of the French. Now, in accordance with that notion of gradual variation, political activity for books should not be dramatic, but should consist, where necessary, of smooth and incremental reforming improvement and the preservation of equipoise. Another way of putting that, of course, would be to say that for Burke, the aim of politics is the maintenance of the beautiful and the avoidance of the sublime in social life. There, there's Burke. Thank you. On to Kant. Yes, I have learned a lot about beauty, um, and which is why I'm going to change the subject. Uh, <laughs> um, um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about um, Immanuel Kant, the aesthetic theory of Immanuel Kant, um, a 17th century, 18th century German um, philosopher. Like Hume, um, Kant also uh, traces um, uh, a aesthetic experiences back to sentiments. Um, like Hume, <coughs> Kant also agrees that there is something intersubjectively valid about judgments of beauty or the sublime that we demand that everyone agree with us and according to Kant if you don't agree it's not because your taste is different it's because you have bad taste <laughs> right? he just said gee you've got bad taste um, so um, and then similarly Kant is also working um, in the uh, tradition <clears throat> which um, understood aesthetics under the categories of the beautiful and the sublime so what I'm going to do is actually talk about the sublime, um, because I think it's a really interesting case where what Kant does is actually, instead of just talking about objects that are beautiful, Kant actually switches over and talks about judgments about objects that are taken to be beautiful, or judgments about the sublime. So there is a kind of um, transcendental turn here where um, aesthetic judgments and experiences are understood by Kant, not in terms of an analysis of the features of the object exactly, but how those features <clears throat> generate in us a certain feeling. Because aesthetic judgments um, are judgments based on feeling. Judgments of taste, uh, this is beautiful, is a judgment for Kant based on feeling. So today what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about the sublime and a really um, and you set it up perfectly for me, Brian. Okay. I'm going to start with a quotation. The vastness of the world which disquieted us before rests now in us. Our dependence upon it is annulled by its dependence upon us. All this, however, does not come at once into reflection, but shows itself merely as the felt consciousness that in some sense or other, 
which philosophy alone can explain. We are at one with the world and therefore not oppressed but exalted by its immensity. It is the transcending of our own individuality, the sense of the <clears throat> sublime. That is a passage from the world as will and representation from our gentleman, Arthur Schopenhauer who studied Kant and misunderstood Kant. <laughs> <laughs> Got him all wrong. The mid 18th century <clears throat> conception of the sublime often centered on the ascetic confrontation with the vastness, intricacy, and splendor of nature. Such confrontations, sometimes even described in mystico spiritual terms, as we just heard Schopenhauer do, um, often found aesthetic satisfaction in the uncanny experience of oneself as part of the infinite that nature was thought to be or to exhibit. And as with a number of the theorists in this period, Kant takes the sublime to center on a unique and complex aesthetic experience, one in which our delight in an object is compli complicated by attendant and contrary feelings of pain and repulsion. Although Kant does sometimes suggest that works of fine art can depict the sublime, say a romantic painting in a of a sublime landscape, or present ideas in a manner that is sublime, especially in the arts of speech, Kant's considered view, and this was common during the, the time, um, is that the sublime is best sought in what he refers to as crude nature, such as the gloomy, raging sea where our feelings of sublimity are occasioned immediately. Thus, we might say that the sublime is loosely associated <laughs> with those aesthetic cases in which we feel ourselves overwhelmed or awed by natural phenomena that present as magnificent or mighty. Quote, it is rather in its chaos that nature most arouses our ideas of the sublime or in its wildest and most ruleless disarray and devastation providing it displays magnitude and might. The formlessness of objects associated with the sublime in nature highlights what is for Kant one significant difference between the sublime and the beautiful. Whereas natural beauty um, leads us rightly to judge appearances as belonging not merely to nature as a mechanism without purpose, but also to belong to nature considered by analogy with art, that is, as purposive for our judgment, the sublime leads us to judge appearances as, as it were, contraproposive for our judgment um, and our aesthetic powers. Indeed, the experience of the sublime serves rather to catapult us into a recognition of a different, a presumably higher purposiveness in ourselves. A purposiveness grounded in our nature as rational beings that sets us all together apart from nature. And such subjective purpo purposiveness can be exhibited and thus experienced um, in accordance with either theoretical or um, dynamical ideas of reason, but we don't have to worry about that. The mathematic, <laughs> <laughs> the math, you'll see. There's two um, kinds of sublime, sublime for Kant, the mathematical sublime, which links up to a theoretical rational demand for totality. Um, relating to the infinite, and then there's the dynamically sublime, which is linked up with um, the notion of an overall, like power or mightiness that overawes us. So we'll start with the mathematical. In cases of the mathematically sublime, this kind of reminds me of um, the folks that were in here talking, like the mathematicians mm -hmm. and the physicists, um, giving us um, just a, um, you know, um, uh, an equation and finding in that this beauty, the mathematically sublime is sort of sounds a bit like that. In cases of the mathematically sublime, it is the boundlessness and sheer magnitude or size of the phenomenon that excites in us the feeling of the sublime. This is where I'm really going with this. For Kant, the sublime is not a property of an object. It's in us. That's what's sublime. Indeed, Kant, so far as to offer this formula that the sublime is that in comparison with which everything else is small. Here, Kant does not intend to say that objects are sublime simply because they are large or great. Rather, he defines the sublime as that which is absolutely large, that is, great in all respects and not merely great relative to something else. 
Interestingly, however, we come to find that nothing given to us in nature actually corresponds to this definition, for it could easily be seen that nothing, quote, in nature can be given, however large we may judge it, that could not, when considered in a different relation, be degraded all the way to the infinitely small. Given this, it follows that nothing actually given in nature is sublime. And this is where Kant's account begins to get interesting. Kant's position is that certain natural phenomena, in this case some of those that present as immense in size, occasion in us a feeling of sublimity by suggesting to our mind the idea of the absolutely great, which Kant identifies with the infinite, also birth. The concept of what is great absolutely, that is infinite, however, is a concept to which no corresponding intuition for our purposes experience um, can be given. In Kantian terms, it is an idea of reason and transcends all possible experience, the infinite, that is. We never experience the infinite, right? We experience little finite things. <laughs> Nevertheless, we find ourselves in this experience striving to exhibit in imagination the object that might correspond to our idea, the idea that is um, sort of um, uh, suggested to us in the presence of overwhelmingly large and magnificent natural phenomena. This turns out to be impossible for the imagination can never achieve a completion of the process by which such a totality could be represented. Moreover, this process, this inevitably unsuccessful striving of the imagination towards infinity under the guidance and direction of reason reveals to us the utter inadequacy of the imagination in apprehending in its entirety that which is given absolutely. Despite our, this is like the dialectic of, you know, <clears throat> the sublime. Despite our lack of success, this process described above serves a positive function, for it illuminates our own rational capacity to think beyond experience. Kant states, here's how he does it. Kant, see, I wrote my paper this morning. Kant states, <laughs> Kant states that the conflict between reason and the imagination itself harmonizes with reason's own law, which dictates that we consider all standards of sense to be inadequate. Thus Kant offers the paradoxical suggestion that the subjective play of the mental powers, here imagination and um, reason, generates a harmony through contrast. This struggle is described in fairly dramatic terms as a conflict or an agitation in which we find ourselves simultaneously repulsed by and attracted to the same object. In this complex mental state, reason's idea presents to the imagine like an abyss in which it seeks to lose itself. Although the lack of accord between um, the faculties, the inability of the imagination to achieve what reason nevertheless demands is the basis for a palpable displeasure, this experience itself carries with it a pleasure or satisfaction of its own kind. For the struggle occasions in us the feeling of our supersensible capacities. And since, as we shall see, this capacity um, grounds a practical human destiny, or what sometimes Kant refers to as our human vocation, we also find a place of pleasure, a, a kind of pleasure resulting from the harmony between this lack of accord and our rational ideas. In other words, the struggle or conflict generated by the imagination's inability, um, uh, which would be in, uh, inability to succeed in accordance with the commands of reason may threaten the death knell for imagination as it fears itself potentially swallowed up by the abyss. But reason emerges victorious and satisfied through this interplay. If we feel humiliated, and that is the term that he uses in the third critique, just as in the first critique. If we feel humiliated in our imaginative capacity, we nevertheless garner a respect for the reason in ourselves. 
what we are experiencing is the power of our reason as it outstrips both the capacities of the imagination and the bounds of sense. Now, let's see. The connection between the, uh, the, sublime, let's see what it, the sublime and the practical use of reason is particularly obvious <laughs> in cases of the dynamically sublime, which Brian actually spoke about also with respect to Burke which are said to involve our recognition that nature as might has no dominance over us. As before, our feelings of sublimity here are occasioned by natural phenomena. In this case, those presenting as powerful or mighty. And here's his description. Bold, overhanging, and as it were, threatening rocks. Thunderclouds, pot <laughs> doesn't it sound like we're Thunderclouds piling up in the sky and moving about accompanied by lightning and thunderclaps. Volcanoes with all their destructive power. Hurricanes with all the devastation they leave behind. The boundless ocean heaved up. The high waterfall of a mighty river, comma, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> and go, By the time you're done, you're going, and then it goes, and so on. Okay. Such fearful phenomena, when viewed at a distance safe enough to allow for aesthetic contemplation, evince a, in us feelings of sublimity. But again, what is truly sublime here is not the natural phenomenon, but the recognition that our reason is both independent of and superior to um, the whole of nature itself. Taken as, uh, taken as a whole. And, and it, once again, the sublimity of our reason is revealed through our internal conflict. Although mighty natural phenomena clearly threaten our physical, that is our natural well-being, and although as such we feel overwhelmed by them, they can never exert a dominance over us considered as purely rational beings. Just as their utter inadequacy in, of our imagination was purposive for reason in the mathematically sublime, so our utter impotence as natural beings is purposive for reason and in accord with its own rational destiny, our destiny as persons. And it is quite, Kant is quite explicit that our rational vocation elevates us above nature itself. So let me just finish this really quick. The suggestion that natural phenomena, particularly those of the kind mentioned by Kant, are deemed sublime only because they reveal to us our superiority over and independence from nature sounds, from a contemporary point of view, perhaps bizarre. <laughs> okay, it made, that's the first, I thought it was bizarre. I mean, I thought he'd lost his little mind and I should only stick with the first critique. I thought he'd lost his mind. Okay, for surely, this was my immediate response, for surely gazing upon volcanoes with all their destructive power or hurricanes with all the devastation they leave behind seems more likely, even from a safe distance, to generate in us a respect not for ourselves, but for nature. Surely, the boundless ocean heaved up itself commands our respect not so for Kant. For what is really sublime here is our recognition that even if nature were to swallow us up whole, it could never exert a dominance over us, considered as persons. And here the Kantian um, conception of respect is at issue. He thinks that respect um, actually, do, objects are not objects of respect. People are, right? Um, so. Um, what Garner, then it, one qu a quick example before I just say goodbye. Um, uh, Kant offers in this connection a really remarkable um, example of sublimity. The example, which curiously has nothing to do either with nature or art, um, attends to situations of war. Kant deploys this example in order to illustrate that what garners our respect and esteem is our collective capacity to support our, um, subordinate our particular interests, indeed our entire natural well-being, to higher principles. For he claims that war not only has something sublime about it, but that the thinking of a people engaged in war becomes more sublime in direct proportion to the number of dangers in the face of which it courageously stands its ground. 
Kant's aim is to suggest that what engenders feelings of sublimity is our capacity to legislate our own human destiny in accordance with principles of reason. What is significant about the warrior is his steadfast commitment to principles, the defense of which may even require the sacrifice of his own natural well-being. Or to put it in other terms, our voco vocation lies not in the protection and cultivation of our biological nature, but rather in a quasi-Socratic willingness to recognize in ourselves a higher destiny that attunes with ideas legislated by reason. Experiences of the sublime may not expand our conceptions of nature as they had for most during that time. Indeed, from a Kantian perspe perspective, they clearly limit it. But they nevertheless provide examples of the way in which judgment uses nature to expand its concept of itself. Um, so nature exhibits... Okay, uh, nature, ex I'm cutting stuff out as I go. Nature exhibits reason's ideas only insofar as it falls short of them and the recognition of this displaces our awe and respect for nature and asserts a respect for the universality in ourselves. Kant's account of the feeling of the sublime is an account of the esteem that we ought to recognize for our capacity to legislate, legislate our human destiny as participants in a universal class of rational agents, and it is this capacity which gives dignity to our projects and which is sublime. Thank you. I have a question for Michelle, given my affinity for Khan. I found that really illuminating. So I don't know anything about, I know what you just taught me about the third critique. Okay. Um, but, so, you know that passage in the first critique where Kant says two things fill me with ever yes. increasing awe? The starry sky is ahead and the moral law within. within. So, why does the moral law within fill you with awe? If that's, a, is, if I understood you, if that's a kind of sublime experience because it's not, it's not an object in nature that's causing you to reflect upon yourself, it's within you. So why is that? an awe or sublime thing. Okay, so this actually is, is um, um, a matter of some controversy in Kant scholarship for the following reason. Um, what Kant wants to do is um, argue for um, an account of the sublime, one which um, uh, he locates with respect to his theory of reason and ideas and so on. So for him, um, in, in, if we're talking about aesthetic judgments, which are judgments based on feeling, yeah. Feeling um, those kinds of aesthetic judgments, um, he will often say, uh, are triggered by, as it were, a natural phenomena that um, um, suggests to our minds. It's like a movement of mind. One thing that happens in the third critique, probably as you know, the third critique is that Kant essentially starts linking up in in, in little random passages um, the idea that maybe morality and sublimity are hand in hand, and some people say that, as, that, that there's no value to the aesthetic, aesthetic experience of the sublime, except that it attunes us to the moral law, all right? I'm gonna argue against, so the first thing yeah, would be, okay. um, Kant could easily say that the moral law is also a case which allows us to um, um, understand ourselves as against sensual nature. That is, the act out of duty is yeah. to you know, yeah. not act out of inclination or, or, and so on, or yeah. sensation. Um, but a lot of people want to say that, that Kant's thing of, uh, theory of the sublime is linked up with morality. I want to argue, I argue separately that in fact there's room in Kant's account for a much less morally circumscribed, the vocation of humanity. <clears throat> not is would include morality, but is not only morality. So there, I do think there's an independent value to aesthetic experiences, aside from morality. Thank you so much. If that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. Appreciate it. Just one more comment about that. At the end of the analytic of the beautiful, because it's not just the sublime, it's also the beautiful that he links up with morality. He says, you could call taste the faculty for the judging of the sensible rendering of moral ideas. So he equates the, the faculty of taste with like the faculty of seeing whether like something contains a moral idea rendered sensible. Um, so yeah, he draws that connection in both. I know. I think both areas. I think we need to separate that a little. 
I'm not sure that uh, Hume and Burke weren't unduly influenced by the fact that they lived in an age that we now call classical, but let me ask all three of you if your philosophers can help me with two very practical problems. Um, in the 1920s, an obscure Frenchman by the name of Marcel Duchamp arrived in New York with a cargo of stuff that he called modern art. And in this cargo was a piece of metal pipe um, that the sculptor who created it called Bird in Flight. And let's imagine that I am the customs officer and I have to decide whether this is art, in which case it comes into the country duty-free, or whether this is a metal pipe, in which case I have to assess a duty of 23% of its fair market value. So that's case one. Case two, once it gets into the country, I'm very attracted to bird in flight. And I want to buy it, but as a very <coughs> practical person, I don't want to lose money on this transaction. Um, and so I really want to know whether bird in flight is worth the several hundred dollars that Duchamp is asking for it. Can any of your philosophers help me with either of those problems? Nick, this is your area. Uh, well, so Hume can help you with the second one, maybe, um, but not the first. Uh, <laughs> Hume didn't have much to say about what art is. Right, what's the definition of art? So the customs officer would probably have to check the definition of art, like the philosophical one that's really respectable, um, and see, does it fit? Uh, and um, uh, Hume had really uh, nothing to say about that. Um, the concept of fine art um, sort of emerged around the time that Hume was writing his works. And even uh, the concept of um, the aesthetic as a distinctive domain um, emerged at this, uh, around that time too. Um, so Hume wasn't really tapped into the sort of the industry of the fine arts that emerged along with uh, various museum institutions and galleries and capitalism in all its um, you know, s splendor. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so Hume wouldn't have had much to say about that. Kant had more to say about what art was. Um, and I don't think Burke had much to say about it either. Um, well, uh, well uh, at the beginning, you're right. you're, this is all about that, the, how you answer the question, what is art? I was also impressed. I can't really made this definition, but you said, uh, all you can say is that art is the sort of stuff that you find in art galleries. And that seems to me as good as anything. And in which yeah. case it would be where it, where it was when you were, or where it was destined when you were trying to evaluate that. But I can't remember who said, do you remember this, do you know this line? Uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a statement, it sounds like, of the institutional theory of art, which is um, art is more or less whatever people in the art world count as art. Mm. Um, and this theory of art was inspired by work like Duchamp's, mm. uh, you know, The Fountain and stuff like that, where it didn't seem to have any distinguishing aesthetic properties it was just in a gallery. Um, so uh, what makes it art? Well, it plays a role in the art world. Um, and that's what makes it art. So um, that kind of theory, you know, if the customs officer had that kind of view, um, I think it would have been admitted, um, so long as Duchamp could prove that, you know, the art world would be into this stuff. Um, with the second thing, I think Hume would have more to say. Uh, but it would depend on institutions connecting, you know, aesthetic value with economic value, which I think the last several decades of um, the art world have proven uh, is not the case, because <laughs> the art world goes through various fads and, um, uh, uh, you know, where um, things are overvalued um, economically, uh, things in the art world, so, um, yeah. I guess I would say, I mean, ironically, Kant is one of the philosophers, although the contemporary use of the term aesthetics as a discipline relating to um, um, art and aesthetic experience was 
taken from Kant. <laughs> so, mm. so um, but ironically, he is not as interested in works of art. He talks about it a little bit. I guess my inclination would be to say, first of all, in order to decide, Kant would be not interested in saying, is this a piece of art, but what is the judgment that it is beautiful? So he would be analyzing the judgment. If it satisfied the conditions for a judgment of taste, um, then you can enter into the do domain where you're arguing. But I think Kant would probably say whether or not the um, 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 individual at the airport or whatever l lets this come into the country or something as a work of art is an empirical question. It means, can I sell it? Like, the, the interest here is practical, and that for Kant is not a judgment of um, uh, taste because it's interested. For Kant to say something is beautiful or sublime, it needs to be disinterested, not linked up with your personal interest to make money off it or make impress people because you've got highfalutin groovy art. Um, or, you know, so for Kant, um, a truly um, um, aesthetic judgment, um, uh, a truly aesthetic judgment cannot be connected up with any interest. So the question is an empirical one. Is the dude going to let you into the country, you know, calling it art or not? But Kant would, that, the question is whether or not it's beautiful. Or, you know, and that would be an analysis of the judgment for Kant, not we, the object. Yeah. We can squeeze in one last um, in your presentation, I saw multiple times the, the term culture. And um, I think traditionally I used to think of a, a defined culture as being pretty much Western European. You know. mm -hmm. um, I've recently been involved in a project um, with Nigerian women where I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what culture means now. I'm confused um, by that, that word when I'm with people from a totally different background. Background, I don't know what the word is. Mm. Can you just help clear? I mean, you probably can tell me. Yeah. Tell me whatever you think. Um, <laughs> it's a tough question. Uh, culture is really vague and ambiguous in English. I mean, so um, we talk about someone as being cultured which means they have certain tastes or certain refined views about various things. Um, culture, uh, you know, can be anything from, you know, just a way of doing things um, to, uh, to something like, you know, culture is how we spend um, our free time, sort of. Uh, the time we don't have to spend just staying alive, we can spend doing other things. Well. Sports, that's part of culture. Looking at art, that's part of culture. Making and watching movies, that's part of culture. The stuff that is kind of, you know, we can spend our free time doing it and it sort of makes life richer. Um, you might think that's what culture is. Um, and if you think culture that way, then lots of different uh, groups can, can have different cultures, right? They can choose to spend that free time doing lots of different things. Um, Western culture has various traditions. Um, that go back many hundreds of years that partly define what it means for us to engage in culture in that sense. But yeah, different groups have different, uh, different ways of spending their free time to enrich their lives. Um, I understand that. I think in thinking about the definitions of what is beautiful and how one comes to that, um, certainly cultural background mm. So, I mean, the, the use of the word is, is, was frequent, mm. but I didn't know how to understand it, to tell you the truth, because it's so broad and so actually mm. ambiguous. Okay, so uh, one of the things that Hume has in mind is um, he thinks that um, even among people who have these cultivated aesthetic virtues, um, their cultures, um, sort of the background practices that they're, they're used to could, uh, could affect um, their ability to uh, see the beauty in something um, or uh, affect their um, degree of approbation uh, that, they, that they give to certain objects. So um, I think you might, I mean, think about um, 
think about different musical traditions. So different cultures have different musical traditions. Um, I might be pretty close to an ideal critic and be really great at judging Western music, um, but when it comes to judging uh, some other musical tradition, uh, have trouble sort of hearing what's good about it. Um, and so it'll take, uh, um, I might still approve of it, given my aesthetic virtues, but my degree of approbation might be, might be, um, might vary because I'm, I'm so brought up in a different culture of, of music yeah. production and appreciation. Uh, I, I wish we could, I, I echo Boris's view that this could go on for, for hours, but we are duty bound to close things down. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you all next week.